When it comes to electronics, most manufacturers try to design their products with a balance of form and function. But this time, let's check out a tiny laptop that definitely skews one direction over the other. While other companies were churning out netbooks in the 2000s and early 2010s that basically looked like shrunken down laptops, Sony was forging its own path. Some of its computers did follow the traditional formula, but a few models turned heads with their unique designs. Here's one of them, a VIO VGN P70H. This was a model sold in Japan, though there were similar ones available worldwide starting in 2009 and in a variety of colors. Clearly, Sony was trying to minimize its footprint with the keyboard as the defining factor. VIOs typically included touchpads, but the P-Series relied instead on a track point to save space. Connectivity was slim, but still decently functional. Power, USB 2.0 and audio jacks on the left, USB and docking port on the right, and somewhat surprisingly for Sony, an SD card slot next to the memory stick reader on the front. To gain a couple more ports, one would need to use the mini docking station, which rather cleverly clipped to the power adapter to keep it from getting lost. This got you a VGA video output and wired network jack, though the VIO had built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth that most owners likely relied on. Sony did manage to find space for a standard definition webcam in the screen bezel, though it had to be shifted off to the side. Overall, it's a very compact and lightweight package, about half the depth of a typical netbook at the time and weighing under one and a half pounds, or a bit over 600 grams. If you needed a computer that was as convenient as possible for travel, it would have caught your eye. And with solid build quality, it feels good to pick up and its glossy finish isn't too big of a fingerprint magnet, at least not in this color. The previous owner of this machine installed Linux, likely in an effort to eke more usability out of the hardware. The UI is responsive enough, but booting the OS and launching applications tends to drag on. Of course, I wanted to experience the machine like it was when it was new, and that involved reinstalling Windows. Vista, to be specific, but it looks like when this machine was resold at some point, someone transplanted a Windows 7 license sticker onto here from another laptop. Getting restore media for Sony's computers is notoriously difficult. There's a great site called the VIO Library that has a collection of recovery disks, but sadly, they don't include the P-Series. I found a set of images on the Internet Archive for the P80H, a similar model to my P70, but with a warning. Supposedly, they wouldn't work with any other model, and they were also Japanese language only. But I decided to give them a shot anyway. I was able to boot the VIO with the first disk and worked my way through the restore wizard to get the hard drive back to a factory state. But sure enough, it popped up an error about the model number not matching and wouldn't let me proceed. I found another set of restore disks, this time for the P530H, which is seemingly the US equivalent model of the P70. Maybe these would be close enough to work? Nope, foiled again. Of course, I could have performed a generic Windows installation, but scouring the web for drivers is a pain, and the bigger problem is that I'd be missing any preloaded software. Thankfully, the VIO library has a solution. An open source utility called the VIO Recovery Patcher can remove these hardware checks, but with the caveat that it can't rebuild the whole recovery disk. To use it, you need to extract the contents of the disk image to a folder, then make a copy of all the files that have a .sny extension. From there, you can point the recovery patcher to these and provide it with a place to save the modified file which is built as a standard Windows install image. I copied the resulting file to a generic Windows installer flash drive, and after booting the VIO, I could press Shift F10 to open a command prompt. 
I used Disk Part to select and format the laptop's hard drive, then a utility called ImageX to write the disk image, which took a while. But once that was done, a single command made the drive bootable, and I could restart the machine. Eventually it got to the Windows Vista setup wizard, and after I stepped through it, it left me at the desktop. The screen resolution was set correctly, which made me cautiously optimistic that all the necessary drivers were there. And a check in Device Manager showed only one that was missing, which I suspect is for the card readers on the front, and not really a big deal. I'd say that hacking the recovery image was mostly a success, though of course your results may vary. Thankfully, the recovery patcher has solid documentation to walk you through it. There was one casualty of using the wrong restore image on this machine, though. There's a curious looking button near the front edge, and if you press it with the laptop powered off, it'll start up. But instead of booting into Windows, it instead just displays an error about the Instant Mode application not being found. This is a small Linux-based OS that you could quickly boot to and use for media playback. And while it's not working quite right for me, we can still check out the experience, because it runs in Windows too. Perhaps not surprisingly, it uses the cross-media bar interface as seen in the PlayStation 3 and PSP. But it's very laggy, and speaks to the major problem with this laptop. It's otherwise damn near useless. Since the keyboard set the shape of the computer, that means it ended up with an ultra-wide 8-inch display. This could have been okay for watching movies, but made productivity tasks or web surfing require way more scrolling than they should. It was very sharp with a resolution of 1600 by 768, but this rendered objects on screen absolutely tiny, so owners found themselves hunched over it to work. But even if relegated to just media playback, it wasn't a perfect solution as its small 2100 milliamp hour battery only offered between two and four hours of runtime. Even if you could deal with squinting at the screen, the typing experience on the Vio P series sucks. It's smaller than standard size, which on its own is easy enough to get used to, but the key feel is awful, somehow being both mushy and springy at the same time. On paper, it's Intel Atom Z520 processor, clocked at 1.33 GHz, sounds comparable to other netbooks from the era, but with just a single core and massively underpowered GMA500 graphics, the machine just can't get out of its own way. Case in point, Quake 3 Arena was a decade old when this FIO launched. At high settings, it should fly on this hardware, and while it does at least make it through a benchmark run, it doesn't do so gracefully. The machine struggles to hit 28 frames a second. Vista was never the best OS, but upgrading to Windows 7 still wouldn't appreciably improve things. Compounding this is the 2GB of DDR2 RAM that's soldered to the motherboard, without any option for upgrades. Taking these machines apart isn't easy, but thankfully some Japanese bloggers documented the process to show the 1.8-inch hard drive Sony had to use to save space. These ran at 4200 RPM and came in 60 or 80 gigabyte capacities, though later models did offer SSDs as an option. Adding insult to injury, base models started at a price of $900 US about double that of a netbook with similar specifications. Reviews from the time generally said the same thing. The Vio P series was certainly a good looking and highly portable option for those on the go, but it was a secondary computer at best, and the price was too high given its performance and limitations. Even these days, owners past and present lament the poor user experience and how big of a missed opportunity this series proved to be their greatest collector's items, but really, that's about it. Yet, that generally seems to sum up a decent portion of Sony's computing attempts. The company released a number of prior models that were unique, but just as compromised in one way or another. The C1 series from 1998 leveraged Sony's purple and gray color scheme, the U series from 2002 had a more typical screen aspect ratio, but experimented with a strange and slow CPU. 
The UX models from 2006 were perhaps the most bizarre with their slide-up screen, but had decent performance. None of these models sold well in the face of their more mainstream counterparts, but all had their own unique charm. The P-Series then was Sony's final attempt at ultra-mobile PCs, a last gasp of Japanese conspicuous consumerism. The company had become synonymous with quirky designs and pushing boundaries, for better or for worse. But amid global recession and an overall trend towards more practical computers, the world simply wasn't interested in a solution in search of a problem. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Please consider supporting my work over on Patreon. And as always, thanks for watching.